So I'd like to start my talk with a deceptively simple question. What is Jewish history? Now, Jewish history is what? The study of an ethnicity? Is it the study of a religion? Is it the study of a nation? Or is it all of these, uh, all of these things? And what I'd like to argue today is that, yes, it's all of these things, but it's also something different. And what I'd like to say is that we need to expand the boundaries of what Jewish history is and how we understand Jewish history. And I'd like to do so by examining this guy, Hans Speyer. Now, Hans Speyer is a very interesting guy. He's one of the most important members of the first generation of defense intellectuals, the, the, the academics who decided that they had something to say about American foreign policy and left the university to have an effect on it. And what I'd like to argue today is that Speyer is, although a non-Jew, technically, religiously, ethnically, uh, he was actually a part of Jewish history. And what I'd like to do is show that he was a non-Jew influenced specifically by Jewish culture that emerged from a specifically Jewish experience, and that he brought this Jewish culture to bear on the Cold War United States. Now to do so, we have to go back, as we always do, to 19th century Germany, and the idea of Bildung. Now, I don't know if, any, if there are any Germanists in here, but Bildung refers to this uh, traditional German process of education that is very internally focused. It's a romantic notion. The idea is that you become educated for yourself. And yes, this education would eventually help you interact in the world, but ultimately, it's a self-directed process. By, through Bildung, you become a full person. You become one with yourself. And this was the idea of German education in the 19th century. Now, over the course of the 19th century, many of you might know that the Jews in Germany, or in the German states, became emancipated over time. It happened at different, uh, different times at different places, but by the late 19th century, all the Jews were essentially emancipated. And so what Jewish intellectuals did was that they decided to become, in some sense, more German than the Germans, and that they fully embraced this idea of Bildung. They were no, long, they were no longer gonna be in the ghetto, they were going to leave the ghetto, join the university, and become a member of the Reich. They were be going to become real Germans. They were going to do it by um, committing themselves to this ideal of building. And this becomes very popular from the late 19th century until around the 1920s. Now, what happens in the 1920s? Well, everyone uh, in here is not speaking German. So we won World War I. And so the German state was completely transformed after their loss in World War I. It was no longer an imperial state, and it became a democratic state. Now, along with democracy came a bunch of other processes. Industrialization, advanced industrialization, advanced democratization of the educational sphere, and a variety of other processes that we today associate with modernity. And as this happened, all of a sudden, this traditional idealist sense of building no longer made sense. The discursive coalition that supported Bildung began to fall apart. And this presented a significant problem to Germany's Jews because, as I had earlier uh, just, just stated, they had used building as a way to assert their Germanness. So what happens is that over the course of the 1920s, a number of prominent German Jews re begin to redefine what building meant. And two of the most important of these were Emil Lederer and Karl Mannheim. And they were both professors at the University of Heidelberg in the 1920s and that they would later become Speyers teachers. Now what both Lederer and Mannheim argued was that they needed to, and what all German intellectuals needed to do, was reform Bildung, not to stress this internal process, but actually to stress practical political engagement with the world. And Mannheim developed a political science uh, specifically organized toward this goal, and a Lederer, worked, uh, Lederer worked for the Socialist Party of Germany, and they basically argued that they needed to reform Bildung to stress practical political engagement. And Speyer was in fact their student, and it was this perspective that he imbibed. So he was born in 1905, and then he uh, matriculated at the University of Heidelberg in the mid-1920s, and he began taking classes with both of these guys. And though he was a Lutheran, and though both of his parents were members of the middle class, he associated himself very forcefully with the left-wing intellectual Jewish community of the University of Heidelberg, and he imbibed this perspective. For Speyer, it didn't make sense to be an intellectual if you were just doing it for yourself. 
It only made sense to be an intellectual if you were doing something for the world. So he associated this Jewish reformulation of Bildung, and he brought it with him to the United States, where he became the youngest founding member of the University in Exile in New York City. Now, some people might know the University in Exile at the New School for Social Research. It saved a number of very prominent academics, including Leo Strauss, Claude Levi Strauss, and Branislaw Malinowski, and later people like Hannah Arendt and Hans Morgenthau taught for it. And Speyer actually became the youngest founding member and also one of the only non-Jewish members of the University in Exile in 1933. But what's most important for our purposes is that over the course of the 1930s, Speyer developed a program of activist exile. And this program becomes most clearly expressed in his 1937 essay, The Social Conditions of the Intellectual Exile. And in this essay, he lambasted his fellow German exiles, people like Max Horkheimer, people like um, Theodore Adorno, who are associated, some might, uh, some might know, with the Frankfurt School, which was at Columbia University. And he lambasted them for basically continuing to argue about debates that he thought had been settled in Germany. For example, whether Marxism was true. Um, what you should do in a newly democratized German state. And instead, what Speyer argued, building off this idea of building that his mentors, Emil Lederer and Karl Mernheim, developed, was that intellectuals needed to become political actors themselves. And this is his political project over the course of the 1930s, and it's a project that emerged directly from the Jewish reformulation of Bildung. Now, luckily for Speyer and a bunch of other exiles, or unluckily for the world, though, is that World War II happened. And what does the US government need during World War II? It needs people who speak German and who know, Germ uh, who know German language, culture, politics, and society. And so what you see is that the government winds up recruiting a bunch of Germans to join it during the war. And Speyer became one of the most prominent people to join the wartime government. He first started his career at the Foreign Broadcast Intelligence Service, being the head of the, and he became head of the division that analyzed all Nazi propaganda broadcast to the United States. And in 1944, he joined the Office of War Information, and this is his, his pass, his OWI pass, where he became the person who actually developed all of the propaganda directives that guided the US propaganda that was directed at Germany. So Speyer was able to, actu uh, to actualize his political project of using his social science skills, his research skills, in the service of the American state to defeat Nazism. And again, this was a project that emerged directly from the Jewish reformulation of Bildung in the 1920s. So Speyer was essentially bringing this Jewish cultural idea to bear in the American context. He did this first in his essays throughout the 1930s, and he did it again during World War II when he became head of this Office of War Information Division, and he later also became head of the State Department's Division for Occupied Areas. So, of course, the war, war ends, ends, but then a number of people become very, very nervous, and these people are military and government officials. They were worried that all of the nerds that they had brought to Washington were eventually going to leave and go back to the university because it was difficult to work in the government. So what they did was that they decided to create new institutions, one of which was the Rand Corporation, that would attract intellectuals to stay in the American, uh, to stay associated with the American government and continue to use their research in the service of the state. And so what you see is over the course of the late 1940s is the establishment of Rand Corporation, uh, of the Rand Corporation. Now RAND stands for Research and Development and continues to exist. It's headquartered in Santa Monica and has offices uh, elsewhere. But it emerged in this context, and it emerged with the specific pur uh, purpose of allowing these intellectuals to use their research and to bring it to bear on American foreign policy. So in 1947, RAND holds this um, conference, and it invites a number of the most prominent uh, intellectuals at the time, people like Bernard Brody, who you might know was a very important nuclear strategist, or Harold Laswell, who reformed, uh, who revolutionized a bunch of different social sciences in the interwar period and beyond, or Franz Neumann, um, and a number of these people. And of course, they invited Speyer. And they were so impressed at the conference with Speyer's ability to bring theoretical concerns to bear on practical politics that they invited him to become the founding head of its social science division. So Speyer accepts this offer, and from 1948 until 1960, he's the director of Rand's social science division. And he oversees the development of a number of the most important ideas of American foreign policy, including various nuclear strategies, as well as political simulations. I don't know if anyone in here was a model UN person, 
But Speyer actually helped develop the idea that you could, through these simulation processes, learn to become better uh, and more efficient decision makers. And again, Speyer is using his knowledge in the service of the state, fulfilling this Jewish reformulation of Bildung that began in the 1920s. So beyond that, Speyer's at Rand, like I said, from the 1940s to the 1960s, but he, he, he uses these connections at Rand to associate with the Ford Foundation, which at the time was one of the most powerful and influential private foundations in the United States. And Speyer helped convince the Ford Foundation, he was actually the crucial person here, that they needed to invest in other organizations like RAND, organizations that would continue to bring intellectual research to bear on American foreign policy. And by virtue of his lobbying, the Ford Foundation helped fund MIT Center for International Studies, as well as Stanford Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences. And MIT Center for International Studies is particularly influential. A number of very famous people, for example, Walt Rostow, who became a national security advisor in the 1960s, as well as Daniel Lerner, who helped develop modernization theory, began their policy careers at the Center for International Studies in the 1950s. And at Stanford Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences, a number of very prominent ideas, for example, the development of comparative politics as a field, occurred in the 1950s. But what's most important is to see these institutions as the realization of this interwar, specifically Jewish project to reformulate building to stress practical political engagement. So in this way, Speyer was able to actualize the um, project begun by his mentors, Emil Lederer and Karl Mannheim in the 1920s. So I return to the original question. What is Jewish history? And what I had hoped to show here is that we as historians and just as engaged people in the world need to expand the boundaries of Jewish history and to consider people like Speyer as part of it. So historians have a phrase called non-Jewish Jews. People who were, whose parents might have converted but were really steeped in the Jewish community. What I'd like to propose is that we need to have a new term, Jewish non-Jews. People like Speyer who chose to live a life in diaspora who married a Jewish woman, who became part of specifically institutions, uh, specifically Jewish institutions like the University of Exile in New York City, and who was able to actualize a Jewish intellectual project begun in the 1920s. So I'd just like to conclude with a plea that we as Jewish historians need to expand the boundaries of Jewish history to consider people like Speyer as part of it. Thank you.